Okay, so it's passed to the butcher, and then you go, Jackie, and you buy this chicken at the butcher. Is it okay to eat that meat if it's been offered to an idol? Well, Paul's answer is your answer. What's your answer? It's not okay, but wait, back up. What did, what did you say originally? <laughs> Part of your confusion here is that what Paul says is kind of doesn't make sense. This is what he says. Do those gods exist? No. Those gods don't exist. So, it's not like the food is infected by that god because that god doesn't exist. So, in fact, materially speaking, there's nothing wrong with eating that food. There's nothing wrong with it. However, you should still not eat it. Why should you still not eat it if technically there's nothing wrong with it? Well, not that per se. What he suggests is that you should not eat it because it might confuse other people. You understand that those gods don't exist, that Anthony's God doesn't exist, so that it doesn't matter that you eat that chicken. However, Jim might think that those gods exist, and that Paul's God exists, and it might confuse you. You might be like, okay, maybe it is okay for me to worship multiple gods at the same time. Because they're eating the food offered to idols, it must be okay for me to worship these other idols. It's unclear, but Paul seems to be saying something like this. So that's basically what he's referring to, something that the elite and some of us people who would not understand? Yeah. So let's look at the passage here. This is, I want to start looking at chapter 8, verse 4. Chapter 8, verse 4. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists. And that even though there may be so-called gods in heaven, um, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, whom, uh, through whom all uh, are all things, blah, 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 yeah, yeah. There's only one God. We know that those idols don't really exist. Verse 7. It is not everyone, whoever, however, who has this knowledge. Right? Jim doesn't know that yet. He's still confused. He's young in the faith, as some Christians would say. You're not, you haven't figured out everything, and you might be confused about this matter. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Now, it's unclear what that means. Maybe it's just confusing Jim. Maybe Jim feels guilty because he's like thinking, wow, I'm worshiping two gods at the same time and maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Maybe that's what he means here by your conscience may be defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Here he's meaning, don't confuse the newer members of your congregation. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So, he's basically like, you guys get it, you guys understand it, but not everybody in your congregation has all the knowledge that you do. Don't confuse them, so just don't eat food offered to idols at all, even though there's nothing really wrong with it. It's really confusing, but that's what he says. So basically, food offered to idols is okay, but not. Is that clear? The last problem that I want to discuss that Paul talks about, do you guys see what I did with my... Good eye. People at this church seem to be practicing the communal meal that is recommended in the Gospels 
Um, it's called the Eucharist or it's called communion. We didn't really talk about this much, but what is the Eucharist or what is communion? In church? Yeah. When you get uh, bread, wafers, and the body of Christ, you drink the wine, which is the blood of Christ. Yeah. The wine, uh, according to Catholics, the wine is officially Jesus' blood. The bread is officially Jesus' body. And by doing this weekly ritual of eating the body and blood of Christ, it's like a continual reminder of what Jesus did. It's a continual reminder of Jesus' message or Jesus' saving power or whatever it is. There's strong evidence that early on churches were doing this. Paul talks about this here. Um, look in chapter 11, verse 17. Oh, I should point out, right, if you if you go to a Catholic church, how much bread do you get? Right, a tiny little wafer, and how much wine do you get? A sip, right. Originally, this was not, uh, it wasn't that ritualized. You actually had a meal, right? You would meet as a church at somebody's house again, and you would have a meal, which would at least include a plate of bread and some wine. So it wasn't like it is now at the beginning. At the beginning, it was just, let's get together, have lunch, and talk about these things. So look at chapter 11, verse 17. Now, in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Right? He's, he's insulting them. He's saying, I've been saying you guys are doing some things okay, and what I'm about to talk about, you guys are dummies. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For, to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, right? He's already been talking about the divisions. And to some extent, I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry, and another becomes drunk. What? Okay, so, coming together for the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist or Communion or whatever you want to talk about it, and we're going to start at 5. Well, Anthony shows up at 4.30, and by the time 5 o'clock rolls around and the rest of you show up, he's already eaten. He's leaving when you guys arrive. And Lauren, Lauren's late because she works until 6. She comes in at 6.30, everybody's gone, or worse, everybody's drunk. He's like, you guys are not doing this together. This is not a group project. You guys are coming, you're eating when you get there, and you're becoming drunk or you're already gone before the other people come. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Here he's suggesting like, right, Anthony, you got a home. If you're really that hungry, eat before you come, right? You're not really coming there just for the food. You're coming there for the community. If all you need to do is grab a bite to eat, do that at home before you come. Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? Now here it seems to be that perhaps some people in the church are more wealthy than others. Maybe Anthony's a millionaire, but Lauren, she's got to work till 6 at her minimum wage job. When she comes... All the food's gone because the rich people like Anthony, they brought just enough for themselves. So you eat till you're full and she goes hungry because it's all gone by the time she got there. 